schedule, so I'll be very quick with my remarks. I'd just like to discuss on a few themes that we've discussed here in the panel, uh, mostly having to do with mobility training. I'd like to pose the question, what's the value of a mobility training? How does that scale? Uh, I need to put on one of the been so diligent with the others. What's the value of a mobility trace and how does that scale with the resolution of the trace? Um, it's been reported in recent literature since about 2009 people have been doing this that mobility traces with cell level res resolution can already reveal a lot of interesting things about our lives. Here on, on, in these charts you see people moving from one cell to the next you can aggregate these data into multiple cells. Even with this coarse resolution, we've been able to claim that 93% of our motion is predictable at the cell level and at one hour intervals. That's a theoretical bound. It's sort of like the Shannon limit. We don't know how to get there, but uh, theoretically it is 93% predictable. Sometimes I don't go to the gym in the afternoon just to throw them off. Uh, uh, also, they're highly unique. I mentioned this earlier. With just four random spatiotemporal points at one hour resolution and, and again cell resolution, you can identify 95% of people. That's, that's interesting and it's all again at this fairly coarse level of resolution. We can also do what's called eigenbehavior analysis. You probably didn't know that when you wake up in the morning, you end up selecting from about four or five basic eigenbehaviors and then doing a linear combination of those and then going about your day. But that's basically what happens if I analyze your movements I can break you up into these, uh, these categories here, and they'll be unique to you, but when I superimpose them, I can basically predict the rest of your day having viewed a few hours of it. And this is work that came out of the MIT Media Lab. All fascinating stuff, and again, it's just cell level res resolution. Now, the Google Now level resolution that we'd seen before in some of Randy's, uh, or uh, Ramsey's work is much better. We're talking about Wi-Fi access points and if Google will enable your GPS device, which draws a lot of the battery, but they sometimes do it, you can report even better resolution here. So you might ask, well, what's the street value of this trace? If we've already been able to extract so much value from the earlier course resolution, what, what could you sell this on the street for? And, and how can we put a price to these kinds of mobility traces? A student of mine offered me these uh, mobility traces. It's uh, Ken Pacina, in case you wanted to know what he was doing. We were actually driving together with this one. I guess I can't uh, turn the video on, but it traced us all the way as we went to Samsung to make a visit uh, uh, from, from Austin. And it did it at, at very good resolution, maybe uh, 100 meters, so it's even better than the cell level resolution. So again, we're asking, what could you sell this for on the street? And, and suppose we went from current resolution, which is uh, three to, to 10 meters, down to street, uh, partial street level resolution, which is at, right at the edge of what you can do with uh, GPS plus WAS today. And we went even further down to perhaps a world where we, we had centimeter level resolution on cell phones. It's might, it might not be so outrageous to think about this. I predict that within about five years, we will have this capability on our cell phones. It's already been in the surveying community for years. It's a question of, of will and uh, of some of the antenna technology and the processing technology overcome the problems of, of the wretched environment that you've got, RF environment in your hand. And suppose we did have this resolution, then we could ask questions of, like, what is the street value of this trace? This is um, a, a, a mobility trace, actually four of them, that my students laid down using a vehicle, a car they were driving with a, a very precise centimeter accurate GNSS system. And you can, uh, you can ask questions of, of this kind of trace. And you might say, well, how does this scale? It turns out if I ask a couple of my fellow WNCG folks here, they will tell me, I would pay for these traces something that I can't know for sure. But what I can say is that it probably goes as the information content of the traces. So if you're talking about macro scale uh, traces, say cell phone uh, or cell um, uh, um, divisions, you're talking about quite low information content. And the uh, work here from Sprint that was published just a couple of years ago analyzed 25 million cell users across the United States for a year. And they were able to come up with these beautiful, beautiful empirical curves 
for the number of distinct locations that one visits at different levels of granularity. So of course, way up here at the state level, you hardly visit uh, very many states, but way down here at the cell level and at the sector level, you have a, a large number of distinct locations. And you can back out from this an entropy of your location or your temporal spatial uh, 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 meanderings. And that ent entropy, of course, gets better as your data are more precise. So the quick answer is the more precise data, of course, is highly entropic. It's going to be more informative, and its street value ought to be greater than that. But then, then you ask yourself, well, intuitively, how does this work? What is it about those data that could be, could be exploited? How, how can I squeeze the orange and get the, the theoretical value out of those data? And it's not so hard to understand. At the city level, all, the, all you can answer are questions like, where do you live? If, uh, if I'm doing data analytics on you at the city level, maybe I notice that you bop across a couple of different cities, but I hardly know anything about you. At the cell level, I can start to mark your daily patterns, these eigenbehaviors. At the coarse GPS and Wi-Fi level, I can determine your approximate context, your local context. But at an even more refined level, at a decimeter level, what kind of other questions could you ask? And I guess I propose that you can begin asking questions about people's immediate present reality. And to, uh, this, uh, to probe this, we did, it, we did a few experiments. Before I get to the experiments, let me remind you of something that was said at TWS just last year from a location-based services strategist who basically said, I am the devil incarnate, and yes, I want it all. I, I asked him, exactly what would you like to know about the customers to, which you're, you're ser to whom you're serving up um, ads? He said, oh, I, what do I want to know? I want to know your location and what you're thinking and your mood. I want to know the most intimate details of your present reality. And that might sound Orwellian. It, well, it, it is. But maybe in other contexts, we would like people to know these things. Uh, we'd like to have maybe a personal assistant like like Siri or others, who help us to forecast uh, our behavior or forecast things that are going to be contingent on our behavior. Another thing that I didn't put here but has occurred to me later is uh, Ahmed's new focus on, on um, bias, uh, what, what do you call it, bias elimination, cognitive bias elimination. If people's uh, moods can be inferred by their location behavior uh, at such fine resolution, you can help people to not make decisions when they're, they're feeling moody. Um, proof of location, Per says, Per Inca says, is going to be indispensable in the economy of the future, and minute location-based behavior is a wonderful biometric identifier. The proof of location can be the trace that took us to where we claim to be, and the, the means of our getting there and the small, the minute patterns laid in, in the breadcrumbs behind us can be a, a, a better proof than perhaps other the technique, techniques that we've been exploring. So anyway, to explore this, my students went out and uh, drove this loop here in, in West Austin, or East Austin, and did so four different times, two different drivers, same car. And I say, we recorded this at centimeter level resolution using something called carrier phase differential GPS, which we predict is going to be on cell phones in, uh, in, the, in the near future. We can look at how they take curves. Uh, Ken, my student, uh, the, the older graduate student, he likes to tell me that the lines are a guideline, not actually a, a law. And he likes to minimize his time and, and lateral acceleration. So he takes a comfortable curve. Here you can see how they end up stopping before a stop sign. And there's a pattern that emerges here. They, uh, some of them, one student stops further from the line than the other. And you see some registration errors here, not because our system is wrong, but because Google's maps are not quite right. Uh, here we can look at a velocity profile. These are the four velocity profiles the, the two students uh, saw or, or that, were, that were the product of their drive. Um, and at first, it looks like it's, it's kind of hard to align and to compare the data. But you can fairly easily align these data because you have exactly the locations where the, the, the velocity was. So you just scrimp and push here and there. And all of a sudden, you can get a profile that looks more like this, where we have time compressed everything so that it fits one of the reference profiles. This is nice because now we can take selections of the data and do analytics on these selections and ask, well, how is your acceleration profile different from mine? You might say, uh, what's this magenta curve here? Why was that one an outlier? Well, it turns out that was the first run. And that was before they noticed the policeman on that part of the road <laughs> in, in the first run. After that, they were much better behaved. 
Uh, so we took a, a power spectral density of the acceleration across several different accelerations and averaged them together. Lo and behold, yes, you do see a, a demarcation, a difference between the two students. There's enough of a difference here that you could probably, as, as you gather more data, determine that there's a, a, a strong personality to the way each person drives. Again, we're working with the same car here, but we hope that we could see this personality expressed through different vehicles. Here's deceleration profile. Again, you see a, a difference. And then the lateral acceleration, uh, like I said, one of my students like to minimize his lateral acceleration. So we're back in this, this, this thought process of what could we do with these crazy uh, high resolution data? Would customers pay for this? Would they feel more, more secure knowing that uh, anyone who's tracking their iPhone is actually well aware of the way they walk, of their gait, and is correlating that against their location? and, and uh, having a, a better sense for the security that that phone is with the intended owner. I'll leave it there, and uh, at this point, um, Empirix has their, uh, their iPad to give away, and uh, they're going to be doing it by drawing one of the business cards from this. Wow. This was a fascinating talk. Uh, my name is Jason, this is Brock, we're from Empirix. I want to say there's been a great amount of data shared Glad to be part of it, and so uh, hopefully we can share an iPad. Uh, Could you mix these up? Yeah. Pick the rectangular one. Bahani Agua Hair. Oh yeah. <laughs> Not bad for a day's work. Thank you, Empirix, and thank you for your sponsorship. Hey, thank you here guys. today. I'm going to turn it over to Ahmed, who will be introducing our next speaker. You can actually, you'll use this. I'll wire it. It's a great honor to introduce our next speaker, Professor Rob Rutenbar. Uh,